Hello everyone and welcome to the third in this year's series of BCLT research seminars in literary translation. Uh, before we go any further, uh, could I just ask you please to make sure that your camera is turned off and your mic muted as we are recording this seminar and uh, we'll be making it available afterwards on BCLT's YouTube channel. My name is Duncan Large and I'm the Academic Director of the British Centre for Literary Translation, BCLT, which is based at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. This year's BCLT seminars are taking place online and as a consequence we're delighted to be able to welcome many new audience members to our events. So if you've not joined us for an event before and would like to find out more about the British Centre for Literary Translation, please check us out on social media at bcltuea uh, and on the web bclt.org.uk where you'll find information about all of our activities. Our speaker this afternoon is William Gregory. Together with Olivia Hallowell, who will be giving a research seminar after Christmas, William is currently one of our two inaugural translators in residence at BCLT. We're certainly working him hard. Two weeks ago, William gave a translation workshop to our MA students, but today we've asked him to put on another of his many hats and give us a research seminar. William is a translator from the Spanish, specializing in the theater of Spain and Latin America. He read Spanish and French at Trinity Hall, Cambridge, and spent a year at the Escuela Navarra de Teatro in Pamplona, Spain, before moving to London and training as an actor at Drama Studio London. William's been translating literary works since 2003, and by now has translated close to 200 plays, many of them by contemporary playwrights as part of the International Writer Development Workshops of the Royal Court Theatre, where he's also a script consultant. He was a finalist in the 2019 Valle Inclan Award for Literary Translation from Spanish for the Oberon Anthology of Contemporary Spanish Plays, and a contributor in the same year to the Oberon Anthology of Contemporary Argentine Plays. His forthcoming published work includes Housing Plan 2015 to 2045 by Bosco Israel Cayo Alvarez, the writer, one of Chile's most important and prolific contemporary playwrights, who will be the primary focus in this afternoon's talk. William's translation of the non-fiction work The Uncapturable by Ruben Schultmacher, a collection of reflections on theatre by one of Argentina's leading directors, has just been published by Matthew in Drama. And let me flag up now that there will be a launch event for that in a week's time, hosted virtually by the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. So I think just search Uncapturable at Eventbrite and you'll see the details for that. That's at 6pm uh, next Wednesday. In addition to his drama translations, William has translated poetry and fiction. This summer, we were delighted to work with William at the BCLT Summer School when he led the Multilingual Drama Translation Workshop. He's a member of the Committee of the UK Translators Association, a visiting research associate at King's College London, and a member of the Hispanic and Lusophone Theatre Translation Collective, Out of the Wings. Just before I hand over to William, uh, let me say one or two more words about the uh, logistics of today's session. As I mentioned, uh, the session is being recorded and will be available on the BCLT's YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, do please feel free to ask questions via the chat function in Zoom, and I'll put them to William on your behalf at the end of his presentation. So without further ado, let me now hand over to William for this afternoon's talk, which has the title, Whose Voice? Translating the Plays of Bosco Cayo. William Gregory. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you too for those plugs. <laughs> Much appreciated. And thank you too uh, to the British Centre for Literary Translation 
and the wider community at the National Centre for Writing and at the University of East Anglia for the opportunity to explore this theme of whose voice, specifically with reference to my work translating the contemporary Chilean playwright Bosco Israel Cayo Alvarez. I use the word opportunity quite deliberately. Being a translator in residence at the BCLT, alongside my colleague Olivia Helliwell, is indeed an opportunity that is both rare and valuable. As a translator of plays from Spanish, who has been playing his trade on and off as a freelancer since 2003, the opportunity of a residency, especially one that is paid, especially during a pandemic, is, to say the least, a boon. Alongside the opportunities I've already enjoyed to engage directly with students of translation through workshops, exploring ideas of voice, and those I look forward to doing the same with students of drama, and even better, both cohorts together, there's also something that a residency offers that a freelancer rarely enjoys, space. In early conversations with Olivia Halliwell and Cecilia Rossi here at UEA, we discussed the idea of a robust space for literary translation. And you can find a blog about that on the National Centre for Writing's website. In that conversation, I talked about the idea of carving out a space and like a spider clinging shakily to it. But today's presentation is the result of space of another kind space to reflect. As a freelancer, this is a rare luxury. The pressure of deadlines, chasing the next job, answering all those emails and life in general seldom gives me space to pause and reflect on my own practice and take time to investigate thoroughly those ideas and questions that are always there somewhere in my peripheral vision, but frustratingly don't often find themselves fully examined. And when in the midst of the act of translation, of the act of creation, the same often applies. The urge to get the work done, to see those exciting results, to see the words in print or embodied on stage, sometimes overrides the imperative to stop and think, not just about what I'm translating, but how, why, and for what, for whom, for whose voice. Another opportunity that's fairly rare in my working life is that of an ongoing collaboration with any single writer. Looking at my portfolio of work done, there are only a handful of playwrights whose work I've translated more than once or twice. So when looking at my own practice, analysis can be difficult. If the writer is different every time, picking out patterns in processes and querying them has added layers of complexity. It is again thanks in part to the space afforded me by the BCLT residency that Bosco Cayo is an exception to this rule. As well as the plays I'll be discussing today, I'll be working on more of his plays within the residency. This confluence of opportunity, the opportunity of space and the opportunity of working multiple times with the same writer, coincides with a series, a series of challenges which I would like to touch on today. Arising from the reality of translating plays into English at a time when we're quite rightly in both the translation and the theatre worlds, asking whose English this is, whose language, whose theatre, whose stories, whose voice. What assumptions have we, have I, made about translation and performance how are those assumptions now being challenged? And how do we face those challenges creatively? It is perhaps as well to start with who I am. All translators bring themselves to their work and I'm no exception. So without entering into a fascinating bio biographical, biological, biographical history, a few salient points. I am a cisgender, white, English, gay, non-disabled, Oxbridge educated man, born in a fishing town in the north of England, Grimsby, but now based in London. I have no Hispanic heritage and instead learnt Spanish as part of a free education when that was still a thing in England. So this is where my Spanish and my English come from. 
I also have a background as an actor, which indeed was what I was doing when I first tried my hand at translating a play. All of the above, whether consciously or not, influences my work as a translator. How could it be otherwise? If we're trying to answer the question of whose voice, well, there's one part of the answer already. But to the voice without whose, none of this presentation would be possible, the voice of the playwright. Bosco Israel Cayo Alvarez, as Duncan mentioned, is one of Chile's most important and prolific contemporary playwrights, winning the country's National Literary Award in 2017. Stretching from the northern deserts of Atacama to Chile's icy southern tip, his work is characterized by a mastery of language that seamlessly combines the mundane and familiar with the epic or grotesque, and a theatrical vision that pulls its audience brusquely from the domestic to the realms of the fantastical. Simultaneously, he tackles the social and political issues of his time, oscillating between the darkest of humor to the viscerally and angrily tragic. Describing his own work, Bosco says, my plays speak of the margins, of that which is not in the center and that which we often forget. I first worked with Bosco in 2013 for the Royal Court Theatre's new plays from Chile season. His play, Negra, La Enfermera del General, Negra, the General's Nurse, was selected as one of five plays to receive a rehearsed reading in the English translation at the Jerwood Theatre upstairs in September of 2013. In truth, the work on the translation had begun over a year earlier. Negra was a new play written by Bosco during a workshop run in the Chilean capital Santiago and commenced in 2012 in a partnership between the Royal Court, the Santiago Amil International Theatre Festival and the Chilean National Council for Culture and the Arts with support from the Genesis Foundation. Under the leadership of the late Elise Dodgson, then director of the Royal Court's International Department, a cohort of Chilean playwrights were invited to each write a new play that would answer a question. As young playwrights, what do you feel needs urgently to be addressed in your society today? Bosco's answer to this question was Negra, a fictionalized account of the dictator Augusto Pinochet's personal nurse who, having been in hiding for several years, returns to her hometown, a small, near abandoned mining village in the far flung deserts of the Chilean North in an attempt to escape retribution for the crimes she has committed. As the play progresses, we see that fate, history and the very earth have other ideas. My work as the translator on this play followed from its genesis right through to the rehearsed reading in September 2013. Each time Bosco wrote a new draft of the play during the workshop process, I translated that new draft into English. Once the play had been selected, I sat alongside Bosco as the company of actors rehearsed for the reading at the Royal Court, and both he and I made final tweaks. And some further fine tuning followed even after that performance. Although typical of the Royal Court's international work, this long process of repeated redrafting and retranslation from start to finish is fairly unusual, as we, shall, as we shall see later. But it did allow for a very close engagement with the text and the writer on my part, and for Bosco himself to be present at every stage of the creative process. I delighted in working on the title character. From humble origins, her association with the leader whom she still adores years after his death has given her a heightened sense of self-importance which clashes violently, indeed horrifically, with the actions of her past and the desperate steps that she will take to, in the play to continue trying to run away. There was particular pleasure in aligning the English to the character's use of vocabulary and terms of phrase in Spanish that were used deliberately by the character to as we might say when accusing someone of snobbery towards the very place they, that they have come from, giving herself airs. As she sits on a long distance coach and in Chile traveling south to north, long distance coach journeys are long. 
Negra is accosted by an anonymous man and employs this, this delight in high register language to put him down a peg or two. I will now attempt to share a slide through the magic of Zoom, so please bear with me. Okay, I think we're there. In this short fragment, the put down begins with a snooty statement about what Negra assumes to be the man's profession. You must be a minor, she says, followed by a tirade of accusations feigning disgust at his assumed sexual practices. Here was a fine opportunity to employ more old fashioned judgment loaded terms such as harlot and hussy to describe the woman that neg the women that Negra associates the man with and to employ the similarly judgmental and studiedly high register fornicate to describe the frequent sex she speculates at his having. Revisiting this scene for today's talk, I also was reminded of a feature of the man's language, which can be seen here in the rendering of usted rather than usted for the word you. Negra would never dream of dropping her Ds like this. But throughout the scene, this is a feature of the man's speech, indicating a more colloquial, lower register and more local form of Spanish. Whether consciously or not, my strategy in Negra was to focus more on the title character's use of higher register language, drawn from her own desire to escape and to emphasize class and educational difference, rather than the use of more colloquial Spanish by characters such as the man. I wonder now to what extent this association of language and class in my translation comes from a particularly English understanding of such an intersection. Certainly, Negra herself seems to think so. Perhaps this line from the character's opening speech in which she defends her beloved general at a London press conference and makes a plea to the better instincts of her British hosts, even invoking that most sacred of British exports, the Beatles, is a clue. Certainly, the Negra we saw at the Royal Court in 2013 spoke with an English accent, beautifully played by Deborah Findlay in an all-British cast alongside Sam Troughton and Suzanne Burden and under the direction of Richard Twyman. We hoped that the reading might be a first step to a full production, but sadly it was not to be. Still, we wait. If class and its intersection with the use of language featured in Negra, it did so even more in the next of Bosco's plays that I translated, El Dilan. Written in 2016 in response to real events, El Dilan charts the aftermath of the brutal transphobic murder of the title character in La Ligua, a small provincial town in central Chile, known for its textiles and patisserie. In a combination of monologues featuring a grieving mother and a defiant best friend, dialogues between the partial perpetrators of the crime and crass interventions from the media, the play alternates between the viscerally heartbreaking and the darkly comic in a heightened style that has become the hallmark of many of Bosco's plays, but that was less evident in Negra, the play crafted during the royal court process. The translation process was also different to the process of Negra. El Dilan came to me already written, and any subsequent rewrites that led up to the publication of the original Spanish text in 2017 were the results not of dramaturgical inventions by a company in London, but by the co-creative approach of the Chilean company that produced it, Teatro La Mala Clase. When I first approached El Dilan, I was immediately struck by Bosco's use of a heightened version of colloquial language and a powerful sense of place. In these opening passages to the play, which are stage directions, but could easily be read aloud, and indeed do seem like a character's thoughts, we are transported to a rural setting with smooth, half-painted green slopes, where houses sit in a valley, where the traffic whizzes underneath a footbridge above a highway alongside a shantytown on the town's outskirts. The sun blazes as it lights up the town, but whoever is speaking feels that this place is full of foreboding, 
and of a life already foretold, an already lived present. In a few lines, the writer is already taking us to a place that is simultaneously beautiful and fatalistic. With the exception of the journalists depicted in the play, the language of the characters in El Dilan is far removed from the high register, studied, aspirational Spanish spoken by Negra. Rather, it is the language of a firmly rooted local population, filled with idiosyncrasies, which the author used to create heightened characters, sharpening the finely tuned contrast between the comic and the cruel. The key to my approaching the translation lay initially in the recurring characters of La Mamita and El Papito, a retired police officer and his wife, who spy on the title character with a fascination that eventually becomes murderous. More specifically, there was one key feature of the way these two characters speak to each other that led me to a particular approach to the translation. As shown in this short excerpt, La Mamita and El Papito refer to each other as Mamita and Papito and do so with extreme frequency. This is repeated throughout all of their interactions. This was combined with the aforementioned sense of place, far removed from the metropolitan centre, and also with a feature in the punctuation of the original, notably the absence of commas before the use of mamita and papito, so a dialogue that runs through at a particular pace, without interruption. Put together, these features led me to think about versions of English where this verbal tick might be common, and perhaps drawing on my own northern roots, or on frequent dramatic and cultural representations thereof by some of our own well-known writers, it was a heightened version of a working class Northern English spoken by an older generation that came to mind. In turn, this led me to try out the characters referring to each other using the Northern English mam and dad, rather than the more generic mom, along with replicating this absence of commas. Once taken, this decision set in motion my efforts further to embed this heightened language into the English, further to replicate Bosco's very strong sense of character and regional idiosyncrasy. So, hijos, children, becomes kiddies. Pegar, to hit, becomes strike. Not a northern word as such, but perhaps an older fashioned one. And empolvoradas, one of the many local bakery treats that La Mamita offers up, became Dusty Buns, which has a particularly satisfying ring to it when the full delight of Northern vowels are engaged. Further examples pepper the couple's exchanges. At one point, chaleco becomes cardi rather than cardigan. No sé, literally, I don't know, might be rendered as perhaps or maybe, but I chose happen. The humble muy, very, becomes right. And the exclamation churra, morphs into the quaint Hell's Bells. The idea of finding an equivalent dialect in the target language to translate a dialect in the source will, I'm sure, be a familiar one to many watching. Northern English is, however, fairly rare in translations, I think. This play and its use of a heightened accent is certainly used to heighten dark humour. But I applied this same approach in scenes that are full of despair. In this opening monologue of the play, the mother of the title character is bewildered, exhausting and exhausted and depressed, having failed to achieve justice for the killing of her child. She turns to a nurse for help describing the traumatic night before the events of the play took place. In this section, she describes her child's flight from their home and her fruitless night-long search. Again, I've used the word ma'am for mother and have replaced, replicated the feature of an absence of commas with sentence running right through. In the latter half of this extract, I've built on this by omitting some words from the English again taking us to a more Northern English mode with weighted at terminus case rather than weighted at the terminus in case. Or I've adopted versions such as froze rather than frozen or while rather than until in I didn't get back while six in the morning. 
You'll also see in this example, however, that the place names remain those that are in the original plane. At no point in the translation did I actively seek to move the story of this play from La Ligua in Chile to any other location. The use of a version of Northern English in the translation is an attempt to reflect the heightened nature of the language of the original, locating the characters a world away from the metropolitan centre and from the received pronunciation that might be celebrated by the eponymous anti-heroine in Negra. An approach like this does, however, make a set of assumptions about casting. I mentioned that in the reading of Negra, the cast was British. More specifically, they all performed in either RP, received pronunciation, or the English of South East England. This worked perfectly well and the performances were excellent. But who is to say whether the approach I took with El Dilan was the right one? Unlike Negra, the translation has not yet been road tested by a company of actors, nor has it been published. Although I have read it aloud to myself many times during the process of drafting and redrafting, and although some of my colleagues, peers, and even potential producers have read it too, the choice to opt for this heightened form of English, inspired in part by my own regional identity, has yet to be put to the test. Would a, would a director agree with the choices I've made? Would a casting director? Would the actors? Were they even my choices to make? I do know that a translated play in a Northern accent can work wonderfully. In 2016, a play I translated originally for the Royal Court, Chamaco, by the Cuban playwright Abel Gonzalez Melo, was produced by Home in Manchester, directed by the then artistic director Walter Meyer Johan. The play is set in Havana in the early 21st century and tells the story of the city's underbe underbelly on a series of nights over Christmas with passions of all kinds breaking out in all directions. I was not involved in the casting or in the rehearsals, but when I arrived to watch the dress rehearsal, it was a delight to hear the Northern cast playing all the roles. More important to me was the reaction of some of the audience members who remarked in a post-show discussion that they had not expected to hear the accents of their local area in such a play. They'd expected received pronunciation or perhaps Cuban accents. Hearing a translated play in a Northern accent was a first, at least for them. I do think that the full representation of the Englishes of these islands is important in our theater and that that includes when we stage plays in translation. I would still like to hear how this imagining of El Dilan would play out if performed as per my current version. But the question of which English we hear, of whose voice is represented on our stages, goes much further than the distance from London to Manchester, or indeed to Grimsby. The translation community is no stranger to this question of who's English. In September of this year, the National Center for Writing hosted a panel on the subject of who is this mythical English reader, chaired by Daniel Hahn, in conversation with Jay Wei Ting, Anton Herr, Somrita Erni Ganguly, and Gitanjali Patel. In this conversation, the notion of an easily definable English reader who can, to quote Daniel Hahn, be used as an excuse to decide what is acceptable and what isn't, end quote, by gatekeepers and decision makers is articulately problematized by all five speakers. One takeaway from the discussion, which you can still hear in full on YouTube and I much recommend, is that there is no one type of English reader and that the assumptions made about who that reader is are often vastly wrong. There is no one English reader of a translated novel or poem. With any luck, they will be many and varied. The same is true of the readership of a published play or hopefully of the audience of a translated play in performance. But in the case of a translated play, before we even get to the mythical English audience, there is an identifiable reader in the target language who may not be the only one, but will likely be part of a smaller group, the actors who will go on to play the roles. I translate into English. Who is the mythical English or English language actor? In translating 
La Mamita and El Papito as mam and dad with their dusty buns and cardies and kiddies? Have I been guilty of translating a, a role for this imaginary figure and therefore closing off the creative potential of the work? And moreover, closing off opportunity for the performers who may do a brilliant job of portraying it. These questions are not confined to those of regional accents that I've touched on thus far. Translation is part of an international, multilingual expression of artistic practice and lived experience. And it is not simply a case of moving a text from one place to another. Just like any other translated text, a translated play does not land in or solely exist or exist solely for a monolithic, monolingual, monocultural space. Just as texts travel from one language to another, from one place to another, so do artists, including, of course, theatre practitioners. This will, I'm sure, not be news to many watching this talk. In theatre circles, the criticism of the British theatre's slowness to engage meaningfully with linguistic and national diversity has been raised plenty of times before, in general, and in reference to plays in translation specifically. Speaking in 2017 at the launch at the Royal Society of Arts of a new playwriting project to address Brexit, sorry for mentioning Brexit, uh, the artistic director of the Young Vic Theatre, Kwame Kwe Ama, observed that in translated plays in the UK, there is a discomfort with perceived linguistic otherness, saying, quote, we even take the Scandinavian stuff and English it up, so we think it's from Wolverhampton. And I think the big question is, do we care? End quote. The tendency to English up translated plays has also been critiqued in scholarship. Writing in 2018, Margarita Lehrer observed, quote, current British theatre translation practices which favour over domestification of the source text to fit the target language, culture and theatrical conventions and described a, quote, prevailing over domesticating approach to theatre translation, which tends to select foreign plays that already conform to the dominant expectations in British theatre, end quote. In the same text, Lyra goes on to criticise British theatre's resistance to casting actors from non-Anglophone backgrounds. Again, this will not be news to many. And in terms of taking action, there are individuals and companies in the UK who are already doing the work to change things and have been doing so for some time. A non-exhaustive list, exhaustive list includes companies such as Global Voices Theatre, Foreign Affairs, Legal Aliens, Untold Collective, Cut the Cord, and, I hope, Out of the Wings Collective, of which I am a part. During the pandemic, several of these companies, along with many individuals, came together to form the Migrants in Theatre movement. In a comprehensive document entitled Creating a Thriving Environment for Migrant Theatre Artists in the UK, published online earlier this year, Migrants in Theatre makes a compelling case for, quote, better representation of migrant theatre artists in Britain, and for, quote, the British theatre industry to become allies in building a more inclusive, diverse and outward looking theatrical sector." End quote. Migrants in theatre does not lay the responsibility for this building exclusively at the doors of theatre in translation. The movement advocates for this inclusivity to apply across the board, whatever the national or linguistic origin of any particular theatre text. But it is beholden on anyone who is interested in theatre in translation to engage in this conversation and to question our own practices in this light. The challenge with translating plays in this context is that the search for speakability, that much criticised and, to quote Susan Bassnett, vexed term that is resistant to any form of definition, still prevails in many theatre contexts with the idea of a translated play needing sound natural still being important to many decision makers. Still, we often hear of the importance of a line in a translation sounding natural or like it would sound if a native English speaker had said it. 
the problem with the notion of speakability has been much debated. But what can be said with some certainty is that the idea of speakability is extremely subjective. Surely the very idea of what is speakable depends in large part on who is doing the speaking. A critique of translations along the lines of, we wouldn't say it that way, begs the question, who is we? Plays in a heightened register such as Bosco's do not sit well with conservative notions of speakability in any case. Perhaps, just perhaps, the case could be made for framing Negra in these terms. But once we're in the realms of El Dilan, the characterization as seen in the original Spanish is taking us to a different imaginative space. So the need to find a speakable translation that sounds natural is already one that I will happily set aside. But by taking an approach to the characters of El, El Dilan that, although stretching the English, still is inspired by an English of a very specific sort, I worry now that the translation of that play in that way goes counter to the imperative for theatre of all kinds, including, but not exclusively, theatre in translation, to be inclusive, diverse and outward looking. Looking at it now, Although I still have affection for those voices I've created in the translation, I'm not so sure they are the right ones. They're certainly not the only ones possible. Rather, there are many possible voices that could find themselves performing the works of Bosco Cayo or any other playwright in English. And as I continue to work on his oeuvre, I've started to wonder what other ways I might be able to find to provide for more of them. By virtue of not having been performed, published, or otherwise road tested as yet, and in particular in light of the above mentioned reflections and questions that I've posed, I now think of the translation of El Dilan as more of a work in progress. While I would like to try out the version as it currently stands, and I do think it would work very well on its own terms, I am open to how the translation might change in light of the conditions of production that might be applied to it. I would however, feel very cautious at this stage about publishing it. Although a published play in translation is still arguably not finished, there is something about committing to print and the knowledge that the translation may travel and be reinterpreted without the translator's further intervention that makes me feel a greater pressure to be sure of having got it right. To borrow from my colleague, translator Kate Eaton, the translated play that is going to be published really does have to be, as she might put it, oven ready. In light of this fixedness of publication, and with reference to the challenge of not taking a translation too far down a specific geographical road in terms of the English, I'll now turn to two of my most recent translations of works by Bosco, which really are works in progress. One is at the proofing stage pending publication in 2021, the other is literally in its very first draft. In 2019, I was commissioned by the US-based publisher, Laertes Press, to translate Bosco's award-winning Plan Vivienda 2015 a 2045 for a forthcoming anthology, The Department of Dreams, a collection of plays in translation set in imagined future dystopias. Rehousing Plan, as we've titled it in English, is set in the industrial port city of Chañaral. In the wake of a landslide and flooding, the citizens wait decades in vain for the authorities to rebuild their city. Although not quite as heightened as in El Dilan, the play once again teeters between the darkest of humour and the deepest of tragedy, using a heightened or stretched version of the local use of Spanish. As in El Dilan, the challenge presents itself of rendering this into English. A further complication for me as the translator of this play is that the publication is for a press based in the US. Although I'm as familiar with US culture as most Brits and can have a stab at translating prose or less stylized dialogue in a way that accounts for the patterns and vocabulary of US English, with a little help from my editor, I'm not so sure I could attempt the same experiments with equivalence that I adopted in El Dilan with the use of Northern English with a corresponding West regional English. 
So taking into account all of these combined factors, the fact that this is for a US, not a UK publisher, the fact that my relationship to Northern English patterns and humor is specific, whereas my relationship to corresponding US regional English is more vague, and the fact that in any event, it may not even be the right approach to choose any existing regional version of English at all, because it may be exclusive to any number of performers who might quite rightly want to perform the piece, the approach I took with housing is different. As shown from this scene later in the play, one feature that recurs heavily through Plan Vivienda is the word po, which anyone familiar with Chilean Spanish will be extremely familiar with. Po is an interjection that will commonly be heard added to the end of phrases in colloquial Chilean speech. It derives, as far as I'm aware, from the Spanish word pues, meaning then or so, and really is ubiquitous in Chile. As you will see in the highlighted sections, however, Bosco uses po in the speech of several of the characters in Plan Vivienda with gay abandon not only at the ends of phrases, but also in the middle of them, and sometimes repeating po po, or even po po po. Po is difficult to translate. It's thrown into normal speech in Chile without a second thought. It could almost be defined as a verbal tick. In some translations, there might be a case for omitting it altogether. But on the other hand, Bosco's use of it here is clearly a deliberate and heightened stylistic choice. Unlike Mamita and Papito, however, it is hard in English to think of an equivalent speech habit. And in any event, as I've already said, I was not sure that the approach taken to El Dilan was quite right for this play. One option might be to leave it untranslated, just as po. But in Chile, po is not a strange word. What is strange is how much it is used in the way these particular characters speak. So for the current translation, I've tried translating po as so. Conveniently, it rhymes, it's also very short, and to English speakers pretty much anywhere in the world, it's a very common word, but one which certainly points to a heightened type of characterization when repeated so very often. Again, in contrast to the approach I took with El Dilan, I've opted in this translation for renderings of more local language that are somewhat more neutral. Perhaps in a similar uh, strategy to the one I took with the man on the bus in Negra, the Chilean Spanish vaya ir rather than vas a ir is translated simply as will you go. And chucha, which might have been hell's bells or blood and sand in El Dilan, is translated as the more neutral heck here. Coming right up to date, eight years after first translating Bosco's work, and in a theatre world, a translation world, and a world in general that feels very different. And for my last example, I'll turn to the play I'm working on right now, whose translation is in a very preliminary stage, and where I'm grappling with these same questions. Set again in the very north of Chile, again far removed from the metropolitan centre, Tal Tal was written in 2014 shortly after Bosco and I worked together at the Royal Court for the first time. The play centres on a group of parents and guardians trying to come to terms not only with the loss of several young people in their local area, but also with the insensitive and neglectful manner in which the authorities insist on investigating the disappearances. Most of the play is set in a group therapy session run by a local psychologist but one who is herself not immune from the emotions running high in their support circle. The translation of Tal Tal, currently as The Children of Tal Tal, is once again initially for publication and for the same US press as Rehousing Plan. And once again, the Spanish spoken by the characters is a heightened version of regional speech. This extract from an early scene in the play identifies some of the features of the Spanish. As the grandmother protests that she needs to be excused from therapy today, or so it appears initially, she uses the i sound rather than the e sound in the phrase esque, it's just, que hago rather than que hago for what shall I do, and mucho rather than mucho for lots or a lot. Later in the scene we see cansa rather than cansada for tired, na rather than nada for nothing, and tigay 
rather than digas for coal. Some of these variations, such as cansar, can be found in many kinds of Spanish. Some are more specific to this local. As these multiple features used in one short section show, this version of Spanish pervades the whole play and most of the characters. Once again, I felt it was important for this use of language to be somehow retained in the play for all of the reasons I've discussed above. And once again, this translation is destined initially for that ostensible permanence of publication by a US publisher. But more present in my mind than ever is the need for a translated play to be mindful of the many voices that may want to interpret it on stage in future. So at this very early experimental stage of the translation, I decided to opt for something much more systematic, almost formula formulaic, to see how it might work. Rather than trying to find an equivalent dialect or trying to translate each of the linguistic traits I've identified here, each with their own specific rendering, I, I tried out making an all-encompassing decision, turning ing to in. There are only four examples in this extract, two doings and two nothings. Similarly, similarly, perhaps to the use of so for po, there is a certain ubiquity of the dropped G in variants of England, English around the world. But as a feature in of itself, it does not locate the English too specifically to anywhere. Hopefully, whoever the reader is, a feature like this is enough to indicate that there is something particular about the speech of these characters and that this is something to be taken into account when performed, but it is not such a regionally located use of sound to exclude the text from being performed by voices speaking English in whatever way matches their own mode of expression. As in the example from El Dilan, it may seem at first that strategies to reflect a heightened language, whether by seeking equivalence or by creating something more artificial, are aimed at heightening comedy. But for me, this is not the sole function of these approaches. I hope the application of this strategy serves equally the more painful and tragic moments of Bosco's plays, which pack a very powerful emotional and political punch. As in the example, um, excuse me, in this final example, from the end of the play, we hear the voice of one of the lost youngsters. The original Spanish is not, in fact, particularly reflective of any heightened language. It is a fairly simply expressed recounting of events or of memories of them from the beyond. But this is an example of how I've applied the dropping of the final G's throughout the text, whether uh, to assist comedy or the tragedy of the events that the characters in the play have borne witness to. So having come right to the present, from a play I translated eight years ago to one that I've only just started working on, I find it hard to draw traditional conclusions. Rather than being able to attempt to summing up a uh, consideration of general principles, I feel maybe I've spent this space of reflection tugging at threads. So much for robustness, maybe more a risk of unravelling. Perhaps those spiders' legs aren't clinging on particularly well after all. I've referred to these later translations as work in progress, but perhaps what this account of this journey from Negra to the children of Taltal Tal has shown me is that it is the process of translation itself that is in constant evolution. As a translator from Grimsby, translating a play from Chile, first for a company in London, then for a publisher in the US, sometimes for a British cast, sometimes for a theoretical cast that might one day be anyone and anywhere, for an audience who knows where, I find myself, as I'm sure many translators do, with so many possible roads to take, uncertain which is the right one. Our translation choices, once made, inevitably exclude the others, the choices we didn't opt for. Exclusion in this sense seems inevitable. If we make one translation choice, we can't make another, at least not at the same time. But exclusion in the other sense, in the sense of the theatre space as one that is exclusive, that is closed, is surely to be avoided. Theatre is, if nothing else, a confluence of voices. 
it is among the most collaborative of arts. And in the case of the play in translation, all that really happens is that another collaborator, the translator, is added to the mix. If William Gregory is the translator, then the translation will be his. It will come from him. It will carry traces of his voice, whether we like it or not. But as I've attempted to suggest in following this journey of translating four plays by Bosco, there are many other voices to be taken into account. The voice of the writer, whose distinctive style and mastery of language is what brings these stories and situations to vivid, angry, funny, devastating life. The voices of the characters as they demand justice, form relationships, offload grief and use words to shape their own identities. The voices of the people who inspired the stories, those marginalised voices Bosco mentioned, whose true life experiences often are ignored by those in power. The translator's voice, but you've heard enough of that already and he's getting a little hoarse. And the voice of the theatre artists, be they directors, actors, designers or others who will, if we are lucky, one day bring these English works to audiences, whatever their own relationship with the English language may be. The idea of accounting in a single translation for all of these voices at once can seem dizzying and fraught with risk. But it is a risk we must take if these stories are to cross borders of language and culture at all. The question remains, and will always remain, how to do it better. And the answer to that, I suspect, lies in listening to all of those voices. So with that in mind, I think it's time for me to stop talking and let some other voices take the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, William. What a, a wonderful talk. I have plenty of questions myself. Um, I can see the applause, the virtual applause coming in across the board. Uh, that was tremendous and so inspiring and so uh, uh, such a, a fascinating insight into your role as a translator, but also the broader questions which you're thinking about at the very at the very cold face, so to speak, of, of translating. Um, I can see that a number of questions have already been coming in on the chat and can I again encourage our, uh, our audience to please ask any questions that you might have uh, via the, the chat function. Uh, so perhaps I can uh, begin by uh, asking some of these questions in, in the chat. Uh, we have, in principle, half an hour or so. Uh, we'll see, see how much time uh, we need. A um, mm -hmm. first question came from Asa, um, and this was when you were uh, talking about um, uh, talking about uh, El Dilan, mm -hmm. and uh, Elsa was asking, uh, I'd be interested to know your views on the possible class implications of making this type of choice, northern vocab and structures in English, and how that might correspond to the source text. Um, so perhaps I know you, you talked a little about uh, 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 about uh, class um, when you were, you were talking about Nigra, but perhaps with mm. El Dilan and the translation choices that mm. you made there. Yes, I mean, I think uh, the 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 answer I can offer there is again this this search for equivalence that I think that that strategy uh, aims for. Um, it's it, it's um, again as as I sort of think further in about that strategy and sort of find myself questioning it and problematize problematizing it more. I think the the question of uh, I equivalence of class and equivalence of 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 of, of use of language generally is 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 always extremely slippery. Um, and uh, I'm very I'm actually now aware that in that little summary where I try to give a description of sort of where who I am, sort of where I'm where I'm coming from in terms of my own identity. I think class wasn't something that I mentioned and. Uh, uh, I think middle is the answer. Uh, you know, I'm I'm certainly from an, in, an industrial town, but I, but I I think I can't honestly claim uh, working class not nurse. So um, I think, although I think many many m many there are many people like me who sort of feel that we we sort of sit somewhere uncomfortably in between those two spaces. And indeed, people have written whole books about these that are, 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 
uh, are much better at articulating this issue than I am. So yes, I, I think that, that there is a, a, a potential additional sort of discomfort there. Um, and I suppose that that question of equivalence, I use, I use Northern um, equivalence again, because it's the one that is closest to me, I think. I, I feel that I'm on, 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 on steadier ground because I, I, know what, I know what it's like to be from uh, that place, but also I know what it's like to hear those, those accents used by others in, in, in whether it's dramatic or comedic settings. I think I'd feel uh, uh, a, a lot less comfortable trying to apply that with a different, uh, a different kind kind of accent, uh, especially in a, a play like Bosco's, where, where the, the, this heightenedness is so marked, and the, the I'm, where I'm, I'm I'm scrappling to try and find ways to communicate that heightenedness. I think perhaps if we're in a more realist zone, uh, we can perhaps use regional. Uh, dialects and it, and it's perhaps less marked when perhaps just giving a voice or a melody or something here I I, I, I agree it's it, it's it's more s slippery yeah um I, I was just uh, perhaps if I could uh, ask a, a question myself um I was thinking uh, clearly Bosco is a, is a very versatile dramatist and the range the sheer range of voices that that uh, Bosco across the plays is uh, is writing mm. um, clearly if you are going to be his translator and translating this wide variety of plays then you need to if possible be up to representing that wide range of voices yourself yes. I, a question for you then about about your homework about your preparation mm. I mean do you do you still feel like an actor preparing a role here as a translator that you perhaps you know, do you want to try a voice so you'll go and try and, and get that voice a bit like a kind of like like a, um, a, a comedian kind of practicing uh, a, a um, uh, an impression or something. Yes. I mean, what what about uh, your own preparation then if you're looking to kind of go a bit beyond your own comfort zone? Mm. I think that, that I think definitely in general terms and I've, ta I've talked about this in in one of the, one of the workshops we did. Uh, a couple of weeks ago where I, I got the poor unfortunate MA students to be doing lots of reading out loud and things that I think, I think re reading, I advocate for reading aloud of one's translations, whatever medium you're working in. And certainly, yes, um, in, in, the, in the sort of privacy of my own home, when I'm, when I'm going through drafts, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with voice and sort of trying to see how it sees and how it sounds and feels. Um, uh, I think that with this, I think another angle I would add in terms of preparation is, is taking into account as well videos I've been able to see of productions of these plays over in Chile, which is really, uh, I used the word uh, sort of stretched, like when one watches the, the, the productions of some of the plays, which Bosco often directs himself or, or directs collaboratively, that stretching is even more marked. You know, we see we see some r really sort of um, uh, stretched performances vocally, uh, with with speeding up and slowing down, and just su such such richness. So um, I guess as well as I've got towards those approaches that I talked about later on, where I'm sort of trying to get away from ideas of a regional English and think more about what markers what markers can I place in the text? Um, ho hopefully, again, that somehow is more appropriate, this, this idea of a stretchedness in the performance and allowing whoever goes away to perform the plays to also have that space to play. I guess, I guess there is risk in applying too much my, my experience as an actor because I don't want to be preempting the performances too much. I, I, uh, I, 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 it, sometimes it's tempting and sometimes there's sort of pleasure in imagining that but on the other hand always one has to be mindful of the fact that when you work with directors or actors they 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 bring such richness to the work that if you've if you give it off doors to their creativity you're doing a disservice to the original in uh in, in a really risky way i guess so it's always a matter of sort of trying to temper one's own 
instincts, I suppose, to be up on stage oneself. I don't know, it's tricky. <laughs> that leads very nicely onto a, a, a question from uh, Kim Coveney, um, who asks about the role of the director. Mm. How much can be left in translating plays up to any director taking it on and localizing it? Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and there's no simple one single answer to that. Um, but it does, but I can maybe cite uh, a, an example of a play that I've been working on uh, this year, where I've had a very direct and very fruitful experience of that. And whereas rather than I would say it being left to the director as such, I've certainly been in a very fruitful collaborative relationship with the director. Um, and uh, that's, that's a play called uh, La Hanna by an, another Chilean playwright, Juan Pablo Aguilera Justiniano, um, which I started working on this year with the support of Global Voices Theatre um, and working with a Chilean director, Mari Jose Andrade, um, who um, obviously being Chilean uh, can understand the original uh, better than I can really, um, and also came to this play uh, with particular ideas about casting, um, but also about this idea of how to, um, within the mise-en-scene, think about these very questions of multilingualism and of uh, the multilingual performer and the presence of uh, Chilean and Latinx performers in English in the UK. And um, I think uh, that led to an extremely fruitful um, sometimes challenging encounter in terms of my assumptions about my translation process being questioned, but where um, Mari Jose was really um, keen to think about these questions of visibility and linguistic visibility. And so we worked very hard to think about how, uh, how could this intention of the use of Spanish in the translation be be uh, integrated into the text and into the process of the mise-en-scene so that so that it went beyond simply the presence of multilingualism the presence of the spanish language and that presence became part of the dramaturgical coherence of the production um, so not so much about whether to use spanish but where when and how to use the spanish in in the in the translation that would result on stage so i think maybe that's a convoluted way to answer Kim's question, but to say that I think that liberty is definitely there for the director, but I really advocate strongly for those, those acts, those, those things to be done in collaboration, uh, because it is in, in the collaborative act, collaborative act of all the, the practitioners in the space of the mise-en-scene that we, that we get what I've come to think of as this dramaturgical coherence in the play that finally results and hopefully then benefits everybody involved. Thank you. So um, when, you're, when you're first submitting your uh, translation to directors and to, to actors to work with them, mm. um, how, how provisional is your, your translation and thinking mm. about these questions about voice and so on, if mm. then as the, 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 the play is rehearsed and perhaps workshopped, um, if then uh, director, uh, director or particular actors want to come back to you with suggestions for alternative voices or perhaps accents and voices that they're more comfortable with and so on, would you perhaps have you rewritten your translation? Uh, how much is it then a, a, a to and fro like that? How, how much do you like it to be a to and fro like that? I, I think that... Um, there's a there is a there is a kind of to and fro that I think um, many theatre translators will be familiar with, which um, is actually that to and fro that I talked about. That oh, we wouldn't say it that way to and fro. Oh. Um, that's uh, and the, the the speakability to and fro, mm. and um, I, I'm sure all the all any any theatre translator who's been in a rehearsal situation will will know they've had that sort of more perhaps more detailed nuance questioning of particular words here and there, particular phrases that particular actors might prefer to say in a different way. Um, that to and fro, um, uh, 
I, I often think it perhaps depends how it is how it is done and how how those questions are asked and the spirit that which what the sense of collaboration is in the room in terms of how one's own work as a translator is oh my camera's switched off that's a bit strange okay oh there we go i'm back um how that um you know and that, that's perhaps more to do with uh, rehearsal room politics or something but this this wider question about a to and fro which is actually you know, potentially about what is the whole approach to the translation uh, and I think the example of Belvillan is quite an extreme potential example. Uh, that's something which, with, with, the, with the very positive and fruitful ex exception of uh, La Hanna, the play I've worked on this year, where really, if you compare the first and the last draft drafts, I would say they're really quite significantly different. Um, it's fairly rare that I've, that, I've, that I've had that kind of experience. Um, but I, I certainly, I think I would certainly like to find myself in more situations like that where where I'm not um, where I'm not necessarily I mean I sometimes like to be just on my own with the text and you know sometimes that's a lovely beautiful way to work but those those experiences where there's a, a real discussion a real discussion between the translator and other theatre practitioners about what is translation anyway you know how do we do it well together you know, really get getting under the skin of those difficult questions in a in a detailed uh, way is something that's so it's something that's quite rare. I think there's rarely the time to do it. There's rarely the resource to do it. Um, uh, and but but when those spaces do emerge, I think I I, I think that they, that it is those exchanges that move move us forwards. I think in rethinking how how we do this well. Mm -hmm. So you you've just been uh, talking about your collaborations with other uh, theatre practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, do they include Bosco himself? Um, do you because clearly you have uh, been working on Bosco's uh, plays for a number of years. You've been working yeah. with him. Do you ever take this kind of question to Bosco himself and perhaps mm -hmm. run some of the ideas that you've got for the voices? past him and see um, how is his English? Is he able to work yeah. with you on the, on, on the, the translation? Um, certainly, as I do with all writers I work with, I, I seek their feedback, definitely send, you know, um, I work with writers whose, whose, whose English varies, um, uh, but I always, I always send my translation and invite, invite feedback and comments and again, like many translators, I have questions uh, along the way, and certainly, with as as I talked about this feeling of semi permanence of, of of publication. Now that we're in the proofing stage, there are quite, quite a lot of comments in the in the track changes margins that are going between here and Santiago in the U.S. Um, in truth, I I haven't had a conversation with Bosco about specific strategies. Um, uh, not not for any particular reason not not because i particularly feel got particularly guarded about them i suppose it's it's more that by by giving him the translation to scrutinize as a whole uh hopefully that opportunity to 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 give me feedback is there mm -hmm. um but but it's a it's a very good it's a very good question to ask now that I've lined up these four plays all in a row you know I mentioned at the beginning the opportunity to stop and sort of go actually what what has been going on in this progression in terms of how I've worked and it's um and it, it's I, I guess it's now that I I think is a good, good time and again with the time that's afforded me during the residency to be working on some more plays perhaps to be having some more detailed conversations about precisely that with him. Thank you. Um, a question from Suvina Katz. Um, amazing talk. Do you ever leave a range of options open in your translation mm. as a cue for future players? Uh, I have never, never have I ever. Um, no, uh, I no, I haven't done that generally. Um, uh, I guess there's two. 
I, I guess because if the, there's two versions, aren't there? I guess there's the one, the one where where publication is going to happen, and I suppose I, um, it it hasn't struck me as as something I want to do in a publication to sort of have lots of footnotes saying, oh, well, you could say this instead, you could say that instead. And then I suppose in terms of plays that are going into, into a rehearsal situation, uh, I suppose that flexibility, uh, although not explicit, is, is implied in the conversations we're going to have and when the actors and the directors start interrogating what exactly is going on. So no, I do know of translators who, who, who do do that, um, uh, who go into a rehearsal room with a very, very rough working document with sort of multiple possible translations for many different lines and sort of go, here you go, here you go actors, work it out amongst yourselves. Um, perhaps I'm not quite ready to let go quite to that extent. Maybe I should be, I don't know. <laughs> Um, a question now from Sophie Stevens, who has recently also joined us at UEA as a Leaving Hume Early Career Fellow. And Sophie asks, I'm thinking about how fixed the published translated mm. text is. Mm. Do you think that a translation such as the example of the Northern translation can act as a signal to actors, directors, companies, that this is a very heightened way of speaking, but one that could be modified for a specific production. Is this where translators' notes have a role to play, for example, as an introduction? Um, yes and no, I guess, is the answer to that. I suppose then we're sort of in the world of what are publishing conventions. Um, my, my, my feeling ten generally in the sort of theatre publishing world, certainly in the UK, and I suspect in, in the US, is that once a play is published, um, you know, often, oftentimes we don't see a play published in, in English until it has already had a production. Mm -hmm. And so there's something, there's something about the published play text being a, um, a record of, an, of, of a play that actually happened. And although that's not necessarily the case with plays in translation that get published, I, I suspect they are read in the same way um, as, as something that has this kind of finality. And I suppose um, whilst, whilst, whilst one, one could put a note and saying, okay, I've done, I've, I've done this into a heightened ver version of Northern English, but you might want to substitute another heightened version of another regional English, um, whilst, whilst I wouldn't, uh, what I wouldn't, I suppose, have a, have a problem with that, I guess then there's the question of, who, who, who is who is doing that, and is it just a case of swapping, just a, a word for another, or if we're saying we're going to effectively translate from heightened Northern English to I don't know heightened Cornish English, uh, is it is it more complex than 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 just leaving it that that open? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. I, I have a question about um, wh when you're uh, translating into a particular uh, dialect or regional usage, um, you must be asking yourself all the while, how far do I go here? Yes. Uh, because I, I was struck in the example that you gave um, where you had, you used mum, for example, yeah. Yeah. instead of mum. And you used kiddies, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was thinking, well, you might perhaps have gone with bands or yeah. uh, something, you know, perhaps even more marked yeah. as a regionalism. So clearly, you're uh, perhaps uh, with every sentence, you're mm -hmm. kind of wrestling in your own mind, well, with well, where are my limits here? Because mm -hmm. there's always the danger of pastiche, isn't there? Absolutely. That, that you'll perhaps introduce something which it might sound like sort of the Monty Python Northerners or something if you're not yes. if, if you're not careful. Yes. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I can only I can only say that there's an there's an extent to which I'm 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 doing it from instinct hmm. um, and from w modes of expression that that feel you know like that that feel somewhat more familiar to me. Hmm. Again, I think with 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 Bosco the, the the, the heightenedness of the language is, 
is really quite significant. I think of all of the the writers I've translated, actually, I don't know that I've come across anyone who who works in who writes characters in particular in this way. And um, I think if ever I've adopted a regional tone or melody or lilt in in other translations that I've done that perhaps more in a um, naturalistic realm, I think I think you would find that in the main the traces of those dialects are fairly are fairly light, I suppose. So there is there is caution there. I think there's also caution when when a play is broadly speaking realistic. Mm. But if you go too far down an English regional dialect, it somehow does tear the play away from its original locale. I think it's very subjective when that happens. Uh, but I've looked back at some of my earlier translations uh, from the very beginning that I saw, and I've sort of winced slightly and thought, okay, yeah, maybe if I had my time again, maybe I wouldn't have used, maybe I wouldn't have used muggins there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's difficult. I think it can only be subjective as well. It's the, that's the problem we're always wrestling with, I think. Um, a question from um, Rachel. Um, when making various decisions, so this play works on an English stage, are there any decisions that you make or would make so the play works better to be read as well as performed? Oh, how interesting. Um, well, I, I, I think the honest answer to that is no. Um, uh, <clears throat> if you mean read as in read by a reader sitting in the comfort of their own home, um, then no, I think I I, th I think the answer is no. Um, I think the the I I I'm a big reader alouder anyway. So I think the pleasure of of reading a play is the facility of the reader to be able to sit and read it aloud to themselves if that's what they want to do. So I think when coming back to this idea of voice, I'm I'm always thinking of spokenness. I actually think about spokenness for pretty much everything I translate, actually. Um, you mentioned you mentioned Ruben's book, uh, The Uncapturable. I have read that translation out loud to myself, all several hundred pages of it, um, several times because I just, um, I just, I just I don't know, like that, I think that's just the place that I come from as a translator, really. And I guess I trust that if a play can be, if a text can be spoken with well and with pleasure and with clarity, then, um then then it will read well as to, as well yeah um a number of of, of responses uh, uh coming through on the uh chat perhaps i'll, I'll take uh, ellen's response surely if you never use regionally specific language all translations would be divorced from any concrete local and therefore blandly uh, mm. concrete locale and therefore blandly universal mm. there's the rub no it's a that's a really good question um Referring back to that fantastic talk about the, mis the mysterious English translator, one of the speakers talked about the danger of flattening a translation uh, in order to achieve some sort of universality. Um, I, 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 I acknowledge the risk uh, in steering too shyly away from uh, di dialect and ver regional version in the target language. I, I think the risk is there. And this is why when I think about the mum and the dad, I've still got that affection for them because I, I do still think, oh, but but if if some actors actually got stuck in with that in a fully produced play, maybe it might be really rich and exciting and 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 do something really powerful. I suppose I suppose I can only say that 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 this whole experience of preparing for this talk has has made me really aware of the fact that any choice we make in that direction or in the other is is one that is and, and I don't I don't like you know we don't like as translators to talk about things being lost in translation but I suppose when you make a choice that is as bold as that you do you do at least lose the other choices you might have made. 
and so I, I suppose what I'm saying is I'm, I wouldn't I wouldn't sit here and say never use a, a, dia a regional dialect, never never try to achieve characterization like that. I suppose I'm just encouraging myself really to think about the fact that maybe there are other strategies and that maybe there are other ways of finding linguistic richness in a translated play and in translation beyond that 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 uh, again and i'm, I'm going to misquote jeremy chiang but i'm sure jeremy chiang is used to being misquoted this idea of not of of, of uh, allowing english to 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 do what it has not done yet by translation you know uh, that's a very bad misquote jeremy i apologize if you ever see this but this great idea of translation being a way for english to be remade and to find new modes of expression that may that okay they may not sound like yorkshire but or or, or, or lincolnshire where i'm from but but there might be something else there that's even rich or rich in a different way and if you give that to an amazing actor and some amazing directors maybe that will go in amazing direction as well so so i guess yeah i i, I just feel that i've become more aware of more choices and thinking more about what we do when we take them yeah uh, anna has just commented jeremy won't mind i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> But think, thinking about what, as a translator, you are adding to the text, I, I was struck uh, when you were uh, on the example from El Dilan of, uh, of Mam and Dad again. I think it was because I, I, I once saw a, a performance of Beckett's Endgame um, with Northern, uh, with uh, uh, actors uh, using Northern English accent, and I was just thinking of I want me Pap and uh, uh, about, uh, and I was thinking that a, a translation in a very particular or a particular kind um, can can just link up with others in the in the target language, of course, and then yes. your translation is circulating then and gaining a new set of references through the translation choices that you've made as well. Absolutely, yes, and I, and you know, and ultimately, I think when I was when I when I think about making those choices, it's because of it's because of a desire for connection, isn't it? It's because of a desire to use features in the language that the audience might be familiar with in some way through different ways of hearing and different codes, and we can we can think in the UK about all of the 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 the, the great northern writers, both comic and tragic, and plays and television, and the, the richness that comes out there and and I think there's, there, there was something exciting to me in the idea of that intersection that you can you can put the play together and say, look, make no mistake, this play is from Chile. We're in Chile. You know, this this is the this is the background. This is what is happening. We're not we're not pretending to be somewhere else. But 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 also we're going to involve this this richness of language that comes from somewhere else, and we're going to throw them all together, and and we we we're, we're going to try and make something. Uh, that expresses the same pain and and darkness and comedy and everything else. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's why, as I say, I'd still uh, I'd still like to see what would happen, but with with all of the caveats now. Yeah, <laughs> we we don't have too much time, but um, there are three very good questions uh, that have come through in the chat, and perhaps we can finish with with those. Um, yeah. Uh, so Eva uh, says, great talk. When deciding on translating in a certain dialect, do you ever struggle with culturally specific references in the original, which might not work with, in this case, Northern mm. English speakers? Well, Dusty Buns is an example. So again, the, 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 there's, a, there's a section in there. There's a whole list. At one point, uh, La Mamita is so desperate to try and persuade uh, El Papito to to eat her pastries that she reels off a whole list of pastries that she's made so so I spent quite a lot of time googling these and trying to find out exactly what they were and then sort of looking at it and going okay well what what, what might an English word for that be um, and again in, within this approach and within that particular strategy again I felt it worked to try and make these English equivalents because again of trying to construct this world that that is sort of enclosed I suppose you know a lot they're sort of shut up in this house peering through the window it's very claustrophobic and 
and so there I, I took that particular strategy and say all right i'll make i'll make english for words for all of these but without saying oh you know I, without saying like eckle cake eckles cakes and bakewell tart but you know sort of making up words really uh but it's often and this is something that i think again many translations will be translators will be familiar with whether it's theater or prose they're translating these 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 cultural phenomena whether it's a singer or a, a foodstuff or a, a, a street um and i and i think generally what we find ourselves doing what i find myself doing is just making these case by case decisions about whether or not we feel that this particular translation that we're making can uh withstand a moment of a lack of clarity or whether it needs a little bit of description or whether it needs a, a, a translation or whether indeed we can just leave the word empolvorada and 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 allow the reader to 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 deal with it it's very mm. case by case i would say mm. thank you um josephine josephine murray asks i was wondering about your translation of stage directions huh. And yeah. she said, uh, I don't remember seeing um, any in the examples that you showed us, but I'm guessing there are some. And mm. if there are any differences between stage directions in the original text that you work with compared with English stage mm. directions? Sure. Um, I find that uh, stage, direct, st stage direction practice can vary hugely, both in English and in Spanish. Um, I think we may be used to a conventional idea of stage directions, but Generally speaking, now in in sort of the you know where are we the twenty twenties, uh, all sorts of practice can be found. Um, so my general my general practice when I'm translating stage directions is just to translate them as they are, um, and whether they are stage directions that are just there for a for a sort of functional indication, or whether or not in the case again of Bosco of them being sometimes very lyrical sometimes very ambitious. We sometimes have in Bosco plays wonderful stage directions like the entire house collapses, the walls fall down, this, and a desert invades the space, the nurse climbs the desert and then falls down a ravine, you know, beautiful sort of operatic stage directions, I suppose. Um, and I, I think- like Goethe Demerung or something. I beg your pardon? Sounds like Goethe Demerung or Absolutely. something. Like yes. That. I mean, it really is such, it's a fantastic operatic moment. I'd, again, I'd love to see that on stage. Um, but um, yeah, no, I think, my, funnily, I think my approach to stage directions is fairly straightforward in that sense. Just do, do what the writer is, does, has done and that tends to work, yeah. A final question then um, from Rod Riesco. Would you ever be tempted to make a version or imitation in the Robert Lowell sense moving away from the original and making it your own? Ah, um, not, no, not really. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that there's a, there's a blurred line between a translation and adaptation, as we know. Um, I, I, uh, my, my practice, my preference, where I feel that I'm, uh, in, in my in my creative self is in is in translation. Um, I think adaptation is a is a wonderful skill. Versioning is a wonderful skill. Um, it's not one that I have. I I have to have the writer's words to like that spider cling on to in order to be able to uh, to to do my creative creative work and. Uh, I've, I've, yeah, you know, I'm not a writer uh, myself, uh, apart from insofar as a translator is a writer. But, you know, I don't write my own work, um, and so no, sim simple answer: adaptation is 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 not uh, a world that I've yet to set foot in. But what a wonderful world you've just been setting out for us, William. Um, it's just gone half past. We're going to need to wrap up. Uh, can I just before we uh, uh, finish? Uh, give a shout out for our next uh, research seminar, which will be on the 9th of December um, at the same time. And that will be uh, Sayantan Dasgupta from Jadavpur University. And he'll be talking about English in India, turn of the century translation practices. So do sign up for that if you haven't already. Uh, don't forget, as I mentioned next week, uh, William will be in action again, uh, launching the uncapturable. Um, but for now, uh, William, thank you so much. 
for a, a wonderful talk and for a very generous uh, set of answers to some very copious questions, which I'm sure indicate the level of interest in your absolutely fascinating talk. So on behalf of everybody, can I thank you, William, for your research seminar presentation. Thank and you. Thank you, everybody in the audience, for your wonderful questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan, and thank you, everyone. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you.